It was October the 4th, 1582. The next day, of course, Friday, should have been October the 5th. But Gregory made it October 15th instead. He dropped 10 days out of the numbering of the calendar, and that brought it all back into harmony again, see, with the solar system. But this did not alter in any way whatsoever the weekly cycle. Friday still followed. Has time been lost? Today, Joe Cruz addresses a subject that has confused millions of people. In a moment, you'll hear the answer to the question about changed calendars and lost days. another question that many people bring up concerning the Sabbath. They say, well, you know, that law of God, the Ten Commandments, was uh, really not given until Mount Sinai. Therefore, the Sabbath was not known in the world until uh, Mount Sinai. Nobody knew about it or kept it before that time. Now, let me establish a point here that is very, very important, friends. I want to assure you that the great moral law of the Ten Commandments of God was in existence long before it was given at Mount Sinai. That's the first time it was codified. But it was known from the very beginning, from the very beginning of creation. God's great moral law of the Ten Commandments was known and understood by the inhabitants of this world. You say, well, now, can you prove that from the Bible? And I say, yes, I can. I'm going to give you four texts right now to prove it. You follow me closely now. Four texts will absolutely, positively prove this point. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says, Sin is the transgression of the law. Remember that? What is sin now? It's a transgression of the law. Sin's a transgression of the law. Now, look at Romans 4, verse 15. In Romans 4, 15, it says, Where there is no law, there is no transgression, no sin. Now, follow me. If there is no law, there's no sin, because sin is the breaking of the law. You follow that, don't you? Now let's take Romans 6, 23 as our next text. And that says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now have you followed me so far? The three texts, sin is a transgression of the law. Where there is no law, there is no sin. And the wages of sin is death. Now please, one more text, and that's Romans 5, verse 14. Romans 5, 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Oh, wait a minute now. This tells us that death was there present from Adam to Moses. What is death? The wages of sin, isn't it? And what is sin? The transgression of the law. And where there is no law, there is no sin. (laughs) Did you follow that now, friends? Sin is the breaking of the law. Where there is no law, there is no sin. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible says that death reigned from Adam to Moses, showing that they had to have sin back there because death is a result of sin. And they couldn't have any sin without the law because sin's breaking the law. So this proves to us today that the law was there. Never had been written, never been codified, but it was known. Do you think uh, that Cain knew it was a sin to kill? Did he? He hid himself, didn't he? And so did Adam when he sinned. Did Joseph know it was a sin to commit adultery? Well, he said, how can I do this great sin against God? He knew it was a sin to commit adultery. And yet the Ten Commandments had not been given. Look at Genesis 26. Genesis 26 and verse 5. Listen to these words. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now here we're told that Abraham kept God's laws and God's commandments. Well, they had them back there. They had the Ten Commandments back there, even though it had not yet been written down or put in codified form. Now I'm going to show right now, prove to you without any doubt, my friends, that the Sabbath was known before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So turn with me to the book of Exodus now. Exodus chapter 16. This is such an important text. I don't want you to miss a bit of it. Exodus 16, and it tells us in the first verse exactly when the events of this chapter transpired. 
In fact, it, it tells you here that it was on the 15th day of the second month. All right, so, you know, it was a certain month and a certain day. Then you go to the 20th chapter where the law is given, and it's one month later. So we know absolutely that the events that we're going to read about right now in Exodus 16 took place just 30 days before the giving of the Ten Commandment law. Let's look at verse 4 here of this chapter. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now here God says, I'm going to test my people to see if they'll keep my law. And, and he's talking to them one month before the giving of the Ten Commandments. And he's going to test them or prove them. Now, friends, what point did he test them on? What point did he prove them on? Was it one of the Ten Commandments that he tested them on? It certainly was. And yet the Ten Commandments hadn't even been given. But they were understood. They were known at that time, obviously. Now, what was the test? Read on in verse 5. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. You see, God gave the manna out there as a test for them. He sent bread from heaven every day for 40 years as they went through the wilderness. They would go out and gather this white frost-like substance off the ground, and this was their food supply for a whole 40-year period as they wandered on the way to the promised land. Now let's notice how this uh, operated for them as we drop down to verse 21 now. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Brother, you had to be an early bird to get your breakfast back there. If you didn't get out there before the sun got up, the whole breakfast melted on you and you didn't have anything to eat all day. But now notice the next verse. It says, It came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will see, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Let me ask you something, friends. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, it doesn't matter what day you keep, just so you keep one day in seven? You ever heard anybody say that? Let me see your hand. Of course you have. Now let me prove right here to you that that is not the way it is. God has never given anybody the right to choose the holy day to keep. He made a day holy and gave it by commandment to the world, and he's never given anybody the right to make that decision for themselves and choose the one that fits their convenience the best. And I'll tell you why he didn't do it. Right here we have an example of three miracles that God worked every week in order to prove to people which day he had made holy and which day they were obligated to keep. And what were the three miracles that he worked every week? First miracle, no manna fell on the seventh day. It fell six days, but not on the seventh day. That's the first miracle. Second miracle, if they tried to gather it through the week, it would spoil and breed worms and stink, and they couldn't eat it. But if they gathered twice as much on the sixth day and kept it over the Sabbath, it would keep sweet and would not breed worms, and they could eat it. Now, there you have three miracles every week that God worked to point out to them which day was holy. And, you know, friends, some people back there got the same twisted idea that a lot of people get today, and they said, well, it doesn't make any difference. I'll just go out and, and, and gather uh, on the seventh day, and I'll keep a different day. I, I, I won't keep the seventh. I'll keep another day. And so they did that. Now let's notice what happened to these people. Look at verse 27. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for together, and they found none. Well, surprise, surprise. I wonder what they expected. God said, there won't be any, didn't he? He said, there won't be any, but these people, they've decided it doesn't make any difference. They'll choose their own day, so they're going out on God's holy day, and they start out on the Sabbath, and, and God meets them there and speaks to them. Listen, through Moses, and, and, and the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? 
When those people went out on the seventh day together, I don't care what their intentions were. I don't care what their plan was to keep another day. God met them as they went out there. And he said, why are you coming out on this day? Didn't I tell you this is a Sabbath? Didn't I tell you I bless this day? Didn't I rest on this day and make it holy? Why are you coming out here and refusing to keep my commandments by working on my holy Sabbath? Friends, let me ask you something. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't he? What do you think he would say to people today who would go out there and violate his holy commandment? Wouldn't he meet them with the same message? Wouldn't he say, how long are you going to refuse to keep my law and my Sabbath? Didn't I tell you this is my holy day? Why are you coming out here? Of course he would do that. I think we see here the absolute evidence, my friends, that God never, never changed the day. And the Sabbath was there even before Mount Sinai. Now, you might say, well, Brother Joe, maybe Jesus decided to change the day later on. Maybe after Christ came into this world and lived here, you know, as a babe, and then grew up and began to teach his message. Maybe he decided another day was better than that day he had made holy in the beginning, and, and so he changed it. What about that? Is it possible that something like that occurred? Well, let's go and find out, my friends. Let's go to the writings of uh, the Gospels and find out what Jesus did about this. Look at Matthew 5. Here we are now in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, we're going to read verses 17 and 18, the words of our Lord himself. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Why, the Lord said, as long as heaven and earth stands, not one small, tiny little piece of my law is going to be altered or changed or done away with. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, my friends. He came to keep it. He came to fulfill it. That means to fill it up with obedience. And he did that very thing. You, don't, you want to know what Jesus did every Sabbath day? Come to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And I'll tell you something, if we didn't have another text in the whole Bible on the subject of the Sabbath except this one I'm going to read right now, we'd have all the information we need on it. Because in Luke 4, 16, he came to Nazareth. This is speaking of Jesus. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, as his what? As his custom was, he did it every week. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, my friends, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, isn't he? He is the example for every one of us, the Bible says. And if I had no other verse in the Bible except this one, I'd know which day was the Sabbath. I'd know which day to keep holy because Christ set the example for you and me by going in every week and keeping the Sabbath and worshiping on that day. Now, I know there are people today who say, well, Brother Joe, I, how do we know that, you know, our day, seventh day now is the same as they had back there? Can we be certain that, uh, that the seventh day on our calendar is the same seventh day that Jesus observed when he was here? Ah, friends, of course we can know that. Now, if we could find that out, if I could prove that to you right now, that we do have the very same day that Jesus observed, and we can locate it and pin it down and identify it without any question, would that satisfy you that we ought to keep that day then? If we find the one Jesus kept and the one that he went in every week to worship on? I hope so. Because I'm going to give you four absolute proofs right now. So there'll be no question ever in your mind as to whether we can identify the, the, the true seventh-day Sabbath today. First of all, let's go to Luke 23. Luke 23, and we're going to begin reading with verse 52. <clears throat> but before I read, I want to ask a question of you folk. Tell me, uh, which day did Jesus rise from the grave? This is known by most everybody. I suppose uh, nine-tenths of the Christians in this city and every city keeps uh, a day, Easter Sunday, on which they believe Jesus rose from the dead. The first day of the week, Sunday, Easter Sunday, the great mass of Christians believe that and know that Jesus indeed rose on that day. Now listen, which day did Jesus die on? 
Good Friday, they call it. Isn't that right? There's no controversy over this. There's, there's no disagreement over this with, with most of the Christian people. Jesus died Friday. He rose Sunday. Now, with that in mind, let's begin reading in verse 52 of Luke 23. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. Now, here he died on the day called the preparation day. Well, that was the day before the Sabbath. That's why they called it the preparation day because they made preparation for the Sabbath. Now, today they call it Good Friday, but the Bible says it was a day before the Sabbath, a day called preparation. Now, let's read on and find out what happens next. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. According to the commandment, which day is the Sabbath? The seventh day, it says, is the Sabbath, the commandment says. And the women here rested that day, according to the commandment, meaning the seventh day, and it followed the day he died, the preparation day. So the next day after Good Friday then was the, was the Sabbath, according to the commandment, which is the seventh day. And listen, Jesus, my Lord, rested from the work of redemption on the seventh day Sabbath in the grave just like he rested from the work of creation on the seventh day in the beginning. Isn't that interesting? He rested from the work of creation on the Sabbath. He rested from the work of redemption on the Sabbath. But now what happened the next day, which was Sunday, the first day of the week? Let's read the next verse, chapter 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, first day of the week, this is the day following the Sabbath, is what we call Sunday or Easter Sunday is what most people call it. And upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Jesus was risen early on that day, the first day of the week, friends. And that Sunday morning, that's the day they call Easter Sunday now. Bless your heart, if anybody can locate Easter Sunday, they can find the true Sabbath day. It's a day before it. And if anybody can find Good Friday, they can find the true Sabbath. It's a day that follows it. In other words, you've got three days in succession here. The day he died in the Bible called the preparation day. And it says the day before the Sabbath and the Sabbath was drawing on. They call it Good Friday today. Then the next day was a Sabbath according to the commandment. Commandment says the seven days of Sabbath, so that's when Jesus rested. And then the next day after that was Sunday, the first day of the week, and he rose on that day, and it's called Easter Sunday. Not a preacher in the country will deny what I'm telling you right now. And my friends, we can find the true Sabbath day by just getting the day in between Friday and Sunday. That's all we need. Now, that's proof number one. Let's go to another proof. The second proof has to do with the calendar. I've had people say, well, Brother Joe, you know, the calendar's been changed so many times that we don't really know which day the seventh day is. The days are all mixed up now because of the way the calendar's been changed and the days have been confused. Listen, friends, if anybody tells you that, you just forget it. That is not the case. That's not the case at all. Let me tell you about that calendar and the change of the calendar. There has been only one change in the calendar since the days of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what that change is. It was made back in 1582 by Gregory. And let me tell you the, the, what the change was. And by the way, after he made a little change in it, he renamed it the Gregorian calendar. That's why our calendar today is called the Gregorian calendar. Before 1582, it was called the Julian calendar because Julius Caesar started that calendar back there about 46 years before Jesus was born. Now, what was this change that was made in 1582 by Gregory? I'll tell you what change was made. You see, Julius Caesar had figured that the exact length of the year was 365 and a fourth days. When in reality, friends, the year was 11 minutes less than 365 and a fourth days. Now, that doesn't seem like very much time, 11 minutes and a year. But over a period of several hundred years, those 11 minutes accumulated. See, they were adding too much time, 11 minutes a year. And so by 1582, 10 extra days had accumulated in the numbering of the calendar. And it was beginning to even throw the seasons off a little bit. So what Gregory did was this. It was October the 4th, 1582. The next day, of course, Friday, should have been October the 5th. 
But Gregory made it October 15th instead. He dropped 10 days out of the numbering of the calendar, and that brought it all back into harmony again, see, with the solar system. But this did not alter in any way whatsoever the weekly cycle. Friday still followed Thursday, Saturday still followed Friday, and the seventh day was out on the end of the week just exactly like it always had been. So, friends, that means then that there's been nothing done to confuse it. By the way, it won't happen again. You may be sitting there wondering what you're going to do 400 years from now when this thing comes around again, maybe. Well, don't worry. It won't happen because they've started dropping out a leap year every 400 years, I believe it is now, so there won't be any further accumulation of extra time in the numbering of the calendar. So that'll take care of that. So when you look at the calendar today and you see Saturday, the seventh day of the week on that calendar, my friends, that's exactly the same calendar that Jesus looked at when he was here on this earth, and that's the same Sabbath that he kept when he was here. So don't worry that you can't find it. You can find it very easily by looking at the calendar. Now, let's take another proof positive, and this has to do with the Jewish people, and I think this is probably the most definite one I could give you. Now, friends, listen, the Jewish people have been keeping the seventh-day Sabbath from the days of Abraham way back in the book of Genesis. Isn't that right? I mean, here's a whole race, a whole nation of people, millions of them, and they're still doing it. They still keep Saturday the seventh day, and they've been keeping it all these years. Now, they didn't even need a calendar as far as that's concerned. They could count to seven. Anybody can count to seven, and when they're counting the days off and keeping every seventh day, there's no problem. But they had a calendar, all right. But nevertheless, friends, here they are now still doing it. And this proves that they didn't lose it. Do you know how the only way that the Sabbath could have been lost by the Jewish people? Let me explain to you. The only possible way that these millions of people could lose it when they're observing it every seventh day would be for the whole nation, all these millions of people, to sleep over an extra 24 hours and then nobody ever tell them about it when they woke up. Now, if that could happen... They might have lost the Sabbath, but uh, they're still keeping the same seventh day that they started with. Obviously, they didn't lose anything. And the seventh day Sabbath, my friends, is still with us. No question about it. One more proof now, and this one is really something. This has to do with the languages of the earth. Did you know that there are over a hundred languages of the earth in which the word for Saturday is the word Sabbath or rest? Did you know that? For example, uh, uh, the Spanish language. If you know Spanish, you know the word for Saturday is the word sabado, which means Sabbath. Now, that's the way it is in 99 other languages. Proving what? Proving that when those languages originated, Saturday was known as a Sabbath, and it was given that name, showing that the Sabbath, my friends, has been with us all through the ages. There have always been people keeping the Sabbath. What a prospect has been presented today, friends, to keep God's Sabbath. Listen, if you're being convicted by God's Spirit to keep His day, won't you decide to do it now, too? I'd like you to have a copy of Joe's message today in print. But before I tell you how to receive that, here are the amazing fact singers with the song, Redemption Draweth Nigh.
Love you.